What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Today, we got Josh Okoji, Minnesota Timberwolves. Josh, how you feeling, man? Appreciate you uh, tuning in with us. Hey, thanks for having me. How you feeling? No, I'm great, man. I'm great. Can't complain, you know? Cool, but uh, let's jump right into it. So I know, you know, social justice and systemic racism, racism is like a big topic for you and everybody else. So speak to the importance of highlighting it and just continuing the conversation. Yeah, I think it's important that everybody uh, of all races do their part in uh, in highlighting and recognizing and just keep continuing to keep the conversation moving because I feel like, you know, we're not that far removed from, uh, you know, slavery. You know, it's about been like 400 years ago. So everybody's grandparent probably been a, a victim of maybe, you know, Jim, Jim Crow laws, uh, you know, back in the day. So I think it's, you know, to like, I think it's important to, acknowledge that it exists because a lot right. of people don't really think it is because everything is so in tune and everybody's like kind of living amongst each other and you might have like a white friend or a black teammate and you, you think everybody's just kind of coexisting so it, it's kind of hard to know that it exists but it definitely does still exist and it's just messed up right now so like to keep the conversation moving to help and just to um, have people help each other. No absolutely and it's funny you say we're not too far removed from it from because like I want to say maybe over a little over 50 years ago, we just got our right to vote and things like that. You know, like you mentioned, our grandparents were, you know, a part of that and still going through that. So it's definitely one of those things to have, you know, ongoing conversation, just, you know, being aware and cognizant of what's going on around us, you know. So can you speak to any of your own experiences as far as like systemic racism or anything that's happened in like your personal life where it's just like, damn, that really just happened? Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of the things be, I mean, there's some instances that I've heard that's been very, like, tragic and very, you know, harsh things, but that none of that um, has happened to me, but it's a lot of subtle things that you see, right. that, you know, a lot of people don't, don't really, for instance, I, um, <laughs> it's funny, because Calvin would, uh, my agent, he'll, he'll, he'll know about this story, <laughs> but, um, like, it was like uh 2020 and my birth it was my birthday around I'm gonna say September and you know usually on my birthday you know my birthday is usually around Labor Day because it's September 1st so I used to like to celebrate it like that first weekend of uh September so yeah. I decided and ended in um in Los Angeles so I spent it in Los Angeles and you know I have my my brothers with me and uh, some of my friends and, you know, we have this Airbnb and we're just staying there for the week. So I'm kind of just having fun during the week. And also like in the mornings, I'll go to the gym and make sure I do my workouts. So um, that weekend, I wanted to take my my friends on a, uh, on a boat ride. Mm -hmm. And that particular time, it was, you know, people were still social distancing. So California had like a law that you could only have like around 12 people on a boat. And I, I told Calvin for like two months prior, I told him, you know, I wanted to probably do a boat in LA. So we, we've been looking for boats and stuff like that. So it, it it got closer to the time. And I'm like, okay, Calvin, have you got any confirmation? He was like, look, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. And I guess in California, there's like a couple websites that manage all the boats in California. So we were constantly like changing, like not changing, but um, I had two people working on the same, like on one boat and none of them could find one. Right. So it was like, until we get to, uh, until I get to uh, California, and we still couldn't find one. And one of my, so one of my friends, he 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 just wanted to do something, just try something out. He changed his profile picture to like a fake like white guy, mm -hmm. just to see if that would work. And oddly enough, we found a boat in like in like uh, in a day, and it, it was fun. <laughs> so then we found the boat, and I, I literally put my deposit in and everything. I talked to the. Uh, I talked to the owner of the boat and everything, and the, we were supposed to go on a boat ride around Saturday. This is around Wednesday, Thursday, and I get a call. I I just got done working. I get a call. The call goes, "Hey Josh, uh, would you send us a picture of your ID?" And I was like, "Okay." So I sent my picture of my ID, yeah. and he said, "Oh, how many people are you having? How many? Uh, what do you expect to do on the boat?" who's going to be there, head count, just give them a head count, make sure we're complying with the rules. And I gave him all the information. He said, okay, perfect. You know, you're good to go for Saturday. This is around Wednesday, Thursday. 
hang up. And literally two minutes later, the same number called me again. So I answered the phone mm-hmm. and he, hey, Josh, uh, I just want to apologize. I'm like, apologize for what? He was like, um, so I know that we thought that you ordered the boat for Saturday, but somehow the uh, app got mixed up and uh, the app got mixed up and that boat was already scheduled for somebody else on Saturday. We will have to send, we're going to have to send you your money back, your deposit back, and we won't be able to uh, have you on this boat. Mm-hmm. And I get really mad. I obviously, I don't say too much. I say, you know, I appreciate you and everything hung up. And now it was like two days and, still can't find a boat and I end up finding somebody else and this particular owner of this boat he was Indian mm. and I, I I got in contact with him and he and it was easy like that same night he made sure that you know I got put in the deposit for the boat we got the boat everything was situated for Saturday it was cool yeah. then the next day I guess the owner of the boat not the manager of the boat who I spoke with, the owner of the uh, initial initial boat hit me up. It was like, hey, Josh, uh, I just want to say hi. We're looking forward to having you on our on our boat and mm. this, that, and third. And, and I go, like, what's your name again? Because I wanted to make sure that, like, I wasn't tripping. Yeah. So he was like, hey, my name is X, Y, and Z. And I was like, sorry, but I got a call yesterday saying that this boat was already booked out for Saturday. And the person was like, no, nobody booked my boat for Saturday. He mm. was like, who did that? And I, and I gave him the, because I guess his, the manager was who I was speaking with, the person who managed the apps on all the boats and right. stuff. And he was like, yeah, uh, nobody's using my boat. Nobody uh, confirmed nothing. I actually received your deposit. And that's why I called you because I wanted to make sure everything was okay because I seen that, you know, we sent something back. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, look, I don't want no issues. Uh, I got my money back, so we're fine. I won't be using your boat. Mm. But X, Y, and Z told me that, you know, that boat was already, you know, already booked and I don't know what y'all got going on, but I'm, I'm fine now. Then we ended up using the other boat and up meeting the Indian guy. He was actually a really cool guy. I still actually talked to him to today and this is like two okay. years later, but, um, but yeah, so that's kind of like an instance where I felt really frustrated that, you know, I had to change a profile picture to get the boat. <laughs> I ID, yeah. they broke me from getting the boat. And then come to find out that nobody really even used the boat in the yeah. first or boat in the first place. So just little little things like that just you just be like, wow, you know, yeah. everybody's dollar is no different than me using the boat than somebody else using the same boat. I mean, but exactly. so that was kind of just my one story I got. Yeah. And you see so many stories like that. Like I remember um this one black couple they were selling their house, you know, someone comes in and puts the value on it. And then they changed like all the family pictures to like a white family. And then they got an extra a hundred thousand dollars on the house right. just because of like images change in the, in the crib or even like black history month. And I feel like it happens time and time again, every year. And it's like some school wants to celebrate black history month by serving fried chicken and watermelon, you know, and that's not really, <laughs> that's not really black history, you know? So just like little small things like that, that I wish, you know, we could just like people evolve from and you know our history is just like much greater than just like you know two items of food you know what i mean for sure so what are like some changes you would like to see in the future when it comes to like things like this uh just and this is so hard like mm-hmm. you don't know it until you know it like for instance like in my situation in my story i didn't know I mean, I kind of knew, but I didn't get that confirmation of what was really going on until like the actual owner of the boat, you know, contacted me. So it was like, just like, I feel like just honesty. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't want to, they don't really want to understand, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm no different than you, you know, they are just raised in a way that could be so subconscious and you don't even know that you're doing it. And yeah. I feel like when we have that honesty and we have conversations and make it like stop the stigma of not talking about it because it's out there, you right. know, just stigma of passive aggressiveness, uh, aggressiveness. And I think once we do that and it becomes more of an open conversation that we can kind of reach solutions. But a lot of times, you know, people don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable, but at the end of the day, it's more uncomfortable for us. Yeah. Than it is people 
who think they're, you know, is uncomfortable for them. So I feel like, like I said, just talking conversations and just law enforcement as well. Right. Actually forcing rules. I think that'll be, you know, um, much more important and much more effective to, to change. Like for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Brianna Taylor, uh, RP, she uh, died because of a no knock warrant and right. uh, police just came and raided her own, or raided her, uh, her home and killed her. And she wasn't the, wasn't the suspect that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And the Minneapolis airlock, you know, he wasn't the suspect, the same no knock warrant. What is this, two, two, three years later since the, two years later since the Breonna Taylor incident and nothing has changed. You know, we already, we already seen instances where somebody innocent has died due to a no knock warrant. Two years later, we haven't done anything on a national level to make sure that doesn't happen again. And now an, an innocent man in Minneapolis died. So right. like now, we didn't see this twice. Are we just gonna not do nothing again and wait for the mm -hmm. next person to die, or are we gonna, you know, say, "Hey, we have a history of this not being the answer to finding who we want," especially if the cops are continually going to the wrong neighborhoods, and it's right. just like just the enforcement of the law. I think that 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 needs to be changed as well. Yeah, and I feel like the human aspect too, like because we're all humans at the end of the day, and I feel like. There needs to be a level of empathy as well. You know what I mean? Like, especially with a no-knock warrant. And imagine you just like sleeping in your bed one in the morning and someone just bangs down, police, guns everywhere. And you're just like frantic, don't know what you're doing. Like, you're you know, yeah. I, I, I sometimes, I like, when I'm sleeping, it, it it might not even be a nightmare. Like sometimes I will set my alarm, but I feel like I overslept my alarm. Yeah. And I'll just like wake up out the bed in a panic. So imagine like somebody like, breaking down your house with guns and lights, you're going to break out in a panic. Right. You're not going right. to yawn and be like, hey. No one's going to be calm in that situation. <laughs> and even the police, like, they have all these guns. They're waiting for sudden movements because mm -hmm. everything they're doing is probably, probably kind of reactional. So if you make a sudden move, they make a sudden movement, it might cost you your life. So I, that shouldn't even be a, a thing in the first place. Exactly. Cool. So speak to your you know relationship with Until Freedom. And we actually had like the the pleasure of interviewing my son, who was like one of the founders of Until Freedom. Yeah, I'm sure he's gonna enjoy this and you speak into the organization. So speak to the work they're doing, like how important it is for them to be so active in the community. Yeah, so my son, he's actually like the uh, I think he I don't know if he's the founder or co-founder of that organization, but he um George when George Floyd uh when he when he was uh killed in Minneapolis, they they had a, a a couple of guys, Steven Jackson had a, uh, he came to Minneapolis and did a kind of hearing press conference there. And that was kind of like my first time kind of stepping into this space. And I, uh, you know, I was invited to go to the press conference. I didn't know what I was going to say. I don't even, I didn't even know if I was going to say anything, but yeah. I just, if they were doing something of that nature in the city, I, I at least wanted to just be there, show my support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there was a lady there who spoke, her name was Tamika Mallory. I don't know if you yep. if you know. I, I heard her speak, and everything she was saying was just like kind of resonated with me, and it was like just so touching. And I was like so in tuned. You know, a lot of times when you hear somebody speak after five minutes, maybe you tune out, then you kind of tune right. back in. Like I locked in for the whole fifteen mi minutes that she was speaking, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, like, you know, grasping what she said. So then, fast forward a couple months down the road, uh. One of my partners hit me that he said that he was uh, doing something with Until Freedom and Tamika Mallory was like spearheading everything. Yeah. And it was even like protest, nothing. It was just like a day in service where they were going to be serving the community, uh, delivering uh, groceries to the to the needy. And um, I was going to be able to meet uh, Brianna Taylor. They were doing it in Louisville where mm -hmm. the Brianna Taylor, um, family, you know, lives, I, I guess. So. I was like, okay, sure, I can do that. So I went down to, to Louisville and uh, me and my teammate, uh, Jerry Vanderbilt, we went down to Louisville and uh, we kind of helped out the community. We did some community service stuff, which is really like kind of stuff that I'm into. Yeah. So after I, that like kind of organization really being on like the forefronts and being on doing the groundwork and not only, you know, talking about this, but actually, you know, walking the walk and helping out the communities. That's when I kind of was like, I like this organization. So. Yeah. I found out that obviously I was going to be doing this kind of 
this talk and this con having this conversation, that was kind of the first kind of thought that I had in my head. And mm -hmm. I actually, um, and, and Tamika, and I said, hey, do you guys know any uh, organizations that help, you know, young black uh, kids or help young or black families? And they gave me a whole bunch of organizations. And I was just I was like, I might as well just give the money, you know, or the donation to you guys. Cause mm -hmm. I've, cause I, I like, I want to put money into where I know people are going to use it the right way. And I've seen them do the groundwork. So I 100% know. Nice. Yeah. Shout out to Tamika and United as well. And, you know, the groundwork, that's important. Because sometimes I feel like you make a donation, you don't really know where the money goes. It kind of just like oh. floats around and you exactly. don't know what's really happening with it. Whereas with them, like you really see the groundwork they put in and like the impact they have on the community. So I'm sure, you know, the donation we're going to make on your behalf to them, they're going to really appreciate it and going to help them, you know, continue the work they've been doing. So for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's a wrap, you know, for this conversation. Josh, thank you so much for joining us and, you know, continuing the conversation as well and, you know, lending your voice to this platform. No, thanks so much for having me. I enjoy myself. Thanks for letting me talk. And yeah. know, obviously, obviously like the first step in, you know, changing history. So appreciate you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.